Welcome to this first video on arterial blood gas interpretation. In the next few videos, um, we're going to go through the sort of strict um, classification or strict interpretation of arterial blood gases. Um, <clears throat> arterial blood gases are obviously a very important tests in the um, in the management of people in respiratory or ventilatory failure. Um, they're a good, very good way of assessing acid-base balance in the body and, and monitoring people's oxygenation and ventilation status th throughout various stages of disease. Now what I'm not going to do in this video is, is go too much into the detail of how we draw arterial blood gases, where they're drawn from, what the indications and contraindications for, uh, for sampling are. Um, I think there's there's better videos out there on the internet to, that you can that you can watch to to um, to gain an understanding of, of that side of things. One that I would ve recommend very highly is the uh, New England Journal of Medicine have um, have uh, videos in clinical medicine and they and they have one on, on arterial blood gas sampling and it's very very good. Um, it takes you through all the indications and contraindications. So I recommend watching that perhaps before if you haven't already, but um, perhaps go and watch that now before before we get started with this because it will really make things make a little bit more sense. So in these videos what we're going to do is we're going to look at um, do that. We're going to look at the strict classification for arterial blood gases and I'll explain what that is a bit more in a minute. So we have strict classification that sort of strict interpretation and that has to be paired with that has to be that has to be classified whilst considering clinical context. So then we're going to spend less time talking about clinical context, um, but we should always be aware that when we're interpreting arterial blood gases, we must be paying attention to clinical context. <clears throat> so this really forms a, a little bit of a cycle here. We have the, the classification, which I'm going to teach you in the next few videos, and but that must be paired with, with clinical context. So it must be interpreted whilst whilst considering what's happening clinically. <clears throat> so this systematic approach that we have to, um, to the strict classification really looks at, at three main things. So the first thing we're going to look at is the acid-base status of the blood. Okay, whether or not we are acidic or basic or alkalotic, as we may say. Um, so we can look at that acid-base status. The second thing we're going to look at is what is the primary disturbance? What's the primary thing that's causing any change in acid-base status? So we're going to be calling this the basic, not to be confused with alkali. I don't mean basic in the sense of being more alkali. I mean basic as in being simple. Basic primary disturbance. So basic primary disturbance. And then finally what we're going to look at is whether or not there's any compensation for that disturbance. So we're going to look at compensation. Okay, so we have acid base status, basic primary disturbance, and compensation. Now the text that I've been using, the reference I've been using for this, um, for these videos is a book by William Malley. It is called Clinical Blood Gases, Assessment and Intervention. I'm using the second edition. It's a, it's a very, very good book. I recommend getting it if you don't have it already, but that will be the reference for most of the videos we have. So let's jump right into it. In Malley, um, we talk about a strategy for uh, interpreting arterial blood gases, and he uses this sort of ABC approach, which I really quite like. So we're looking at the ABCs of ABGs. So he has this ABC approach. And you'll notice that how we have A, B, C. So we're talking about acid base, basic primary disturbance, and compensation. That's going to be our three sort of steps to, to getting a good interpretation, a good strict classification of blood gases. So as I mentioned, the first step is, is just this um, acid base status. So let's find a color for acid base. Maybe we'll use red. As it's about blood. So we have the acid base. Acid base. So what do we mean by that? Really what we're looking at here is we're going to be looking at the pH of the blood. Um, that sort of power of hydrogen ions I think is sometimes what they use to ref to refer to pH, this the pH of the blood, how acidic or basic it is. Um, 
and that's the pH of the arterial blood. Okay, it's an arterial blood gas. So we're gonna look at the pH of the arterial blood. That's gonna be the primary thing we look at when we assess acid-base status. So the normal range that I'm gonna be using for these videos for pH is 7.35, just put that more in the center here. It's gonna be 7.35 to 7.45. Now, at the institution that you're at, that, that, that normal range may differ very slightly, but it's, it's going to be pretty close to that. And this is a widely accepted normal range for um, arterial pH. <clears throat> so, and what we're going to be looking at with this pH is whether or not we are acidic. So acidic would be on the lower end of the pH. So maybe we'll draw a little arrow here, acidic, or whether or not we are alkalotic. Alkalotic. So it also could be referred to as basic. Um, so there's two real situations, or we could also have a normal pH, which would be inside within this normal range. So let's look at acidosis first. So acidosis. So acidosis is just a condition in the blood where the blood is more acidic than it should be. It's outside of this normal range. So it's going to be when the blood is is less than the pH of the blood is less than 7.35, right? So our pH is less than 7.35. That is the lower limit of our normal range. So that's when we're going to have a, a situation of acidosis. Now, acidosis is generally, generally has a depressive effect on the body, on, on the central nervous system, I should say. Generally depressive. Okay, generally depressive on CNS. So it generally has a sort of subduing or depressive effect on the central nervous system. And the, the symptoms of acidosis tend to be that of sort of lethargy and sort of gradual decrease in level of consciousness. And when we have a very, very low pH, it can lead to coma, being in a coma, and obviously can lead to death. We generally accept in medicine that a pH less than 6.8, 6.80, for a extended period of time is is not compatible with life so not compatible with life okay so we don't really accept a, a pH of less than 6.8 for very long the body cannot uh, cope and cannot maintain its function at a very very low pH like this <clears throat> so that's acidosis as we've mentioned generally depressive effects on the CNS can lead to coma and death and below 6.8, we're really not looking at something that's compatible with life. And on the other side of things, we have alkalosis. So alkalosis. And that is when our pH is above the normal range that we've set here. So our pH is going to be greater than 7.45. It's not very neat. There we go. Now, what effect does this have on the body? And as you may have already started to guess, it's going to be a, a, a kind of an opposite effect of what acidosis has. Alkalosis is generally generally causes a sort of excitatory effect on the on the CNS. It generally excites excites the CNS. Okay, so symptoms of alkalosis are, are typically irritability. Um, we can put that down. Irritability. It can lead to convulsions. So it's you can see how it's it's this is exciting the central nervous system rather than depressing the central nervous system. And similar to our, our 6.8 here, we, we, we generally accept in medicine that a pH greater than 7.8 is not, for an extended period of time, it is not compatible with life. Okay, not compatible with life. So we can see from these two that we have, whilst our normal range is really quite tight, we have uh, a relatively, I mean, we're talking about compatibility with life here, so these are quite serious, but 6.8 to 7.8 may seem like a small change in pH, but when you remember that this is a logarithmic scale, a pH change of 1.0 means that the hydrogen ion concentration difference between 6.8 and 7.8 is 10 times, right? So from here to here, there's a 10 times the concentration of hydrogen ions. 
So it's a pretty large swing in the concentrations of hydrogen ions. Now, what I'm not saying is that it's okay to be down at 6.8 or 7.8. These are obviously the extremes. But there is a 10 times difference in hydrogen ions that can be sort of with accepted for a very short period of time. So what do we say? We've said that the acid base status of the arterial blood gas looks primarily at the arterial pH. This is what we're primarily focused on is the pH. Um, and we're going the normal range for that is 735 to 745. Less than 735 is considered acidic, causing an acidosis, a condition of acidic pH in the blood. Um, that generally has a depressive effect on the CNS. It can lead to a decreased level of consciousness, drowsiness, eventually coma and death. Uh, below a pH of 6.8, we're not really considering that compatible with life. On the other end, an alkalotic pH is one that is above 745. Um, it generally has an excitatory effect on the CNS, leads to irritability, convulsions, and once we get above 7.8, we don't really consider that compatible with life. Now, having said that, for short periods of time, these may be tolerated if they're quickly um, brought back to normal, but for extended periods of time, these pHs here really, really don't lead to very good outcomes at all. In the next video, we'll have a quick look at, we'll start to look at the next part, our basic primary disturbance.